I would like to present to you a case for the historical existence of Jesus. Lately, there have been many people who have been claiming that there is no evidence to verify his actual existence. It has become so widely claimed by recent speakers that most of us take for granted what we have been told, although it is rare to find anyone who has actually looked for themselves to verify this claim. First, you should know that this view is a new one. All throughout history, skeptics used to claim that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, or that his miracles were only parlor tricks, or that the disciples stole his body from the tomb, but they never claimed he didn't exist. Claiming that he never existed only became possible recently due to the long period of time that has passed since the first century. In actuality, there is much more evidence for Jesus' existence than there is for almost any important or famous person of that time. In this presentation, we will be using only non-biblical evidence. In other words, we won't be using the Bible to prove the Bible. Cornelius Tacitus lived from 55 to 120 AD. Tacitus was a 1st and 2nd century Roman historian who lived through the reigns of over half a dozen Roman emperors. Considered one of the greatest historians of Rome, Tacitus verifies the biblical account of Jesus' execution at the hands of Pontius Pilate, who governed Judea from 26 to 36 AD during the reign of Tiberius. Tacitus writes the following. Christus, the founder of the Christian name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procreator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also. It would confirm the following, that Jesus did exist, that he was the founder of Christianity, that Jesus was put to death by Pilate, that Christianity originated in Judea with Jesus, and that Christianity later spread to Rome. Let's move on to Lucian of Samosata. Lucian was a second century Greek satirist and rhetorician who scornfully describes his views of early Christianity. Though he ridicules the Christians and their Christ, his writings confirm Jesus was executed via crucifixion and that he was the founder of Christianity. He says, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day. The distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship their crucified sage and live after his laws. What this passage reveals and how it confirms the biblical account. 1. That Jesus did exist. 2. That Jesus was the founder of Christianity. 3. Jesus was worshipped by his followers. and 4. That Jesus suffered death by crucifixion. Next we're going to look at Flavius Josephus. This is what was written. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribes of Christians so named for him are not extinct at this day. We will now examine the second passage given to us by Josephus. It says, So Aeneas assembled a council of judges, and brought before it the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James, together with some others. And having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. Even if we dismiss the disputed works in Josephus' testimonium, we still see he testifies to a number of things in the above two passages. One, that Jesus lived for, in the first century. He performed miracles. Some believed Jesus to be the Christ. He was a teacher. He had many followers. He was tried by Pilate. He was crucified. He was the founder of Christianity. And, he, and James was the brother of Jesus. Next is Pliny the Younger. 
Pliny the Younger admits to torturing and executing Christians who refused to deny Christ. Those who denied the charges were spared and ordered to exalt the Roman gods and curse the name of Christ. Pliny addresses his concerns to Emperor Trajan that too many Christians were being killed for their refusal to deny their faith. He says, I asked them directly if they were Christians. Those who persisted, I ordered away. Those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians worshipped both your image and the image of the gods and cursed Christ. They used to gather on a stated day before the dawn and sing to Christ as if he were a god. All the more I believed it necessary to find out what was the truth from two servant maids, which were called deaconesses, by means of torture. Nothing more did I find than a disgusting fanatical superstition. Therefore, I stopped the examination and hastened to consult you, on account of the number of people endangered, for many of all ages, all classes, and both sexes already are brought into danger. Though Pliny states some of the accused denied the charges, a recurring theme in the correspondences between Pliny and Trajan is the willingness of the true believer to die for Christ. This would hardly be reasonable if they knew he never existed. Next is Celsus. Celsus was a second century Roman author and an avid opponent of Christianity. He went to great lengths to disprove the divinity of Jesus, yet never denied his actual existence. Unfortunately for Celsus, he sets himself up for crit criticism by mimicking the exact accusations brought against Jesus by the Pharisees, which had already been addressed and refuted in the New Testament. There are two very important facts regarding Celsus which make him one of the most important witnesses in this discussion. Though most secular passages are accused of being Christian interpolations, we can accept with certainty that this is not the case with Celsus. The sheer volume of his writings, specifically designed to discredit Christianity, coupled with the hostile accusations presented in his work dismiss the chance immediately. Also, the idea of Celsus getting his information entirely from Christian sources, another reoccurring accusation against secular evidence, is wholly absurd. He is obviously aware of his opponent's belief, as anyone who is engaging in a debate should be. Celsus wrote his exposition in a form of dialogue between a, quote, Jewish critic and himself. This gives us cause to believe that he used non-Christian, probably Jewish, sources. On Jesus' miracles, he writes, Jesus, on account of his poverty, was hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired certain magical powers. He returned home, highly elated at possessing these powers, and on the strength of them gave himself out to be a god. It was by means of sorcery that he was able to accomplish the wonders which he performed. Let us believe that these cures, or the resurrection or the feeding of a multitude with the few loaves, these are nothing more than the tricks of jugglers. It is by the names of certain demons and by the use of incantations that the Christians appear to be possessed of miraculous power. Not only does Celsus confirm Jesus' existence here, he also tries to debate the source of his miracles. Like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, Celsus tries to dismiss these miracles as both demonic possession and cheap parlor tricks. However, he is clearly grasping at straws. On one hand, Celsus accuses Jesus of performing magic learned in Egypt, then later states it is by the power of possession, then states the miracles were not really miracles at all, but were illusionary tricks performed by a deceiver, then finally states that the miracles never occurred. Gaius Suetonius Tranquilius lived from 69 to 130 AD. Suetonius was a prominent Roman historian who recorded the lives of Roman Caesars and historical events surrounding their reigns. He served as a court official under Hadrian and as an analyst for the imperial house. Suetonius records the expulsion of Christian Jews from Rome, mentioned in Acts 18 verse 2, and confirms the Christian faith being founded by Christ. He says, As the Jews were making constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus, Claudius expelled them from Rome. And we know that the Christian authors were obviously referring to Jesus when they spelled the name Christus. Next is Thallus, unknown to 52 AD. Although his works exist only in fragments, 
Julius Africanus debates Thallus's explanation of the midday darkness which occurred during the Passover of Jesus' crucifixion. Thallus tries to dismiss the darkness as a natural occurrence, a solar eclipse. But Africanus argues, and any astronomer can confirm, a solar eclipse cannot physically occur during a full moon due to the alignment of the planets. Felgen of Tralles, a second century secular historian, also mentions the darkness and tries to dismiss it as a solar eclipse. He also states the event occurred during the time of Tiberius Caesar. This is what was written. On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness. The rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and the other districts were thrown down. The darkness Thallus, in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the fourteenth day according to the moon, and the passion of our Savior falls on the day before the Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun, and it cannot happen at any other time. Felgen records that, in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at the full moon, there was an eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly that one of which we speak. Next is Mara Bar Superian. Mara Bar Superian of Syria penned this letter from prison to his son. What advantage did the Athenians gain from putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as a judgment for their crime? What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger, the Samians were overwhelmed by the sea, the Jews, ruined and driven from their land, live in complete dispersion. But Socrates did not die for good, he lived on in the teachings of Plato. Pythagoras did not die for good, he lived on in the statue of Hera. Nor did the wise king die for good, he lived on in the teaching which he had given. Now moving on to the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is an ancient record of Jewish history, laws, and rabbinic teachings compiled throughout the century. Though it does not accept the divinity of Jesus, it confirms the belief that he was hanged, an idiom for crucifixion, on the eve of the Passover. It says, On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, some texts say Yeshu the Nazarene, was hanged, which means crucified, forty days before the execution. A herald went forth and cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Any Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. There are many more accounts that refer to Jesus and his existence from the first and second century. And this, of course, does not include the many books and letters contained in the New Testament, where even the critics agree it was penned by at least five different authors. So we're talking about different letters from different times claiming to be, in some cases, eyewitness accounts of the historical happenings of the events of this man's life. Some common questions are, why is there no physical evidence or personal writings to verify Jesus' historicity? The Bible has been accused on several occasions of committing historical errors, but has later been proven accurate through archaeological finds. For instance, the Old Testament mentions a tribe of people known as the Hittites. Skeptics pointed out that there was no such civilization in history, yet in the 19th century, records of the Hittites were discovered within Assyrian ruins. Today, we know a lot about the Hittites, such as their language, craftsmanship, geography, and empire chronology. The New Testament mentions the pool of Bethsheba as a place where Jesus healed a paralytic. No such location was known to exist until it was discovered in Jerusalem as a place where the sick would gather to seek healing. Just because an artifact has not yet been recovered does not mean none exists. In regards to personal writings, Socrates, for example, exists only in the writings of his students. There is not a single document still in existence that contains his original works. If we apply the same logic with Socrates, skeptics used to determine Jesus' historicity, 
we must assume Socrates was a figment of the imagination of his students. But if we are to accept Socrates as a historical figure based on four secondary accounts, we must also accept Jesus as a historical figure whose life was documented by his disciples, historians, and those who rejected his divine claims. In conclusion, a lot of evidence has been presented during this discussion to confirm Jesus Christ as a historical figure. We have viewed accounts taken from numerous authors of different theological backgrounds, and we have answered some common skeptic questions concerning Jesus' historicity. I purposely avoided using biblical evidence to support the existence of Jesus because that would be using the Bible to prove the Bible. Instead, we focused this study on extra-biblical sources. However, early Christian historians and witnesses were unanimous in their accounts that several New Testament books were written by eyewitnesses of both Jesus and the apostolic ministries. If these authors were indeed eyewitnesses, we can believe that they also provide evidence to the historicity of Jesus. Some readers may be satisfied with such evidence, some may not. Whatever the case, I encourage you to examine all the facts for yourself before reaching your conclusion. But how do we know that the Bible, as we have it today, is reliable? You know, for a very long time, people argued that much was lost in translation. Since the Bible was really an ancient book translated for new generations, uh, skeptics argued that something had to be lost each time the text was translated. Well, they could argue that, and did it very well, in fact, and they could say that the earliest manuscripts we have are um, from only from a thousand or so years ago, or a little bit more. Until an amazing discovery took place in Israel in 1947. And that discovery changed everything. I'm sure you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But you know what I want to do today? I want to take you to Israel, to the very place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So I can tell you about the significance of what that really meant in terms of the reliability of the Bible. Behind me a desert landscape, but within this landscape was found one of the most important archaeological treasures in the history of modern Israel, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The community of the Essenes lived here 2,000 years ago. Amazingly, in 1947, a shepherd boy tending his flock, his goats in this area, lost one of them and went searching for that particular goat. He came to the caves behind me here and threw in a stone trying to see if the goat would react. But instead he heard the, the crashing or the breaking of pottery. That intrigued him and he climbed down in and he found jars and in the jars these scrolls. He didn't know what they were, but he realized they must have some historical, archaeological significance. Word of mouth spread. Eventually it came to the ears of the Jewish authorities and they found a way to acquire as many of the scrolls as they could. In fact, archaeologists came to this region and began searching in all the caves and they found many more of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are preserved today because they tell the story of life in Israel thousands of years ago. But more importantly, they tell the story of the Bible, at least in the Old Testament part of the Bible, and what was so amazing about these particular scrolls was this, that those scriptures written on animal skins more than 2,000 years ago are virtually identical to the Bible we have today. In other words, what some people thought would be lost in translation was not. The Bible we have today is almost identical to the Bible written on the Dead Sea Scrolls. What an amazing find this was. Now these scrolls are preserved in climate controlled vaults where they can be kept for future generations who will learn about the history of Israel, their long history in this particular land. This next section is called, Did the Bible Come from Supernatural Origin? Or as I like to call it, how do you explain that? So I've taken a clip that has 101 scientific facts the Bible declared long before scientists ever did. 
or before the discovery of man, and I just highlighted some of them here. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, just to give you a quick synopsis of it, what the Bible claims is that all scripture is God-breathed. In other words, every single word written was inspired by God. It's actually God talking himself. That's what it claims, at least. So let's go ahead and let's uh, check out the first one here. So the first one is Job 26, 7, which talks about hanging the earth upon nothing. In other words, the earth is held up by an invisible force, gravity. So before this could be observed or found, it was actually thought that the earth was held up by a giant turtle, or that it was held up by a giant elephant, or that it was held up by a pagan god named Atlas. So the Bible states that long before this discovery ever happened. How do you explain that? In Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 13, God tells the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, about sanitation and how to be sanitary. It wasn't until World War I when we discovered that we need to isolate our human waste. In fact, you might have heard of those Western towns during the gold rush era where they would just throw their human waste, they would actually throw crap into the streets and it would just make the whole town really, really sick and filled with disease. Well, how do you explain that that was in the Bible thousands of years before we discovered that we need to isolate our human waste? In Job 38.16, it talks about the springs of the seas, the springs of the oceans. Well, this was discovered in 1966 that there's actually springs that come out from the ocean floors. In fact, in 2003, it was discovered that there's actually more water underneath the ocean floors than there is in the oceans themselves. Well, so there's springs that actually come out from the ocean floors into the seas. This is not discovered till 1966, and yet it was in the Bible, written in the Bible thousands of years before we made that discovery. How do you explain that? In Leviticus 17.11 and 17.14, it talks about the fact that blood is necessary for life. Blood is a source of life. And although we take it as common knowledge today that blood is needed for life, in fact, actually 120 years ago, people didn't think that. And people were bled to death many times because there was this thing called bloodletting and they didn't think it was needed for life, so they just thought that it would help with curing infections and diseases. In fact, George Washington died from bloodletting two different occasions for a throat infection. They bled him out 3.75 liters, and that's actually how he died. So this was recently discovered 120 years ago, yet it was in the Bible thousands of years ago. How do you explain that? In Genesis 1.1, Hebrews 1.10, and Hebrews 1.11, God talks about the fact that the universe had a beginning and is actually growing older over time. Well, starting during the 1900s, science started to confirm the fact that the universe did have a beginning and that it is actually growing old. We have supernovas, stars that die, and so we know that it's growing old as well. Well, before then it was thought that the universe was eternal. You know, this was written thousands of years before the 1900s. And so, you know, how do you explain that it's in the Bible before we discover this, before scientists discover this? Isaiah 40.22 talks about the circle of the earth. And in Hebrew, the word circle comes from the word spherical. In other words, that the earth was a sphere. In fact, it was this verse that inspired Christopher Columbus to sail around the world. You see, most people thought that the earth was flat and that if you actually tried to sail around the world, that eventually you would sail right off the edge of the world, that it was a flat piece of land. And so the fact that the earth is spherical, we recognize today, but this was not discovered until the 15th century. So, you know, the Bible had this written in there thousands of years before. Are you seeing a pattern? How do you explain that? Job 38, 24 reads, By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? 
And so this actually tells us two different things. Number one, that the light can be divided as Sir Isaac Newton discovered. And number two, that the light actually causes the wind. It scatters the wind. And that wasn't discovered until 150 years ago by meteorologists that it's actually the light, the heating up and cooling down of air that causes the wind on the earth. In other words, the heating up and cooling down of air is what causes the wind, and that comes from the light of the sun. So once again, recent discovery, written 4,000 years ago. Psalm 8.8 talks about the paths of the seas, and it wasn't until the 19th century by an oceanographer named Matthew Murray that this was actually discovered, that there's actually naturally occurring paths in the seas. And it's actually this verse, once again, like Christopher Columbus, that inspired Matthew Murray to go out and discover this. Nowadays, marine navigators use these paths in order to shorten travel times through the oceans. It was this verse that inspired him to go out and look for it, so obviously it was written beforehand. How do you explain that? Jeremiah 33:22 talks about the fact that the stars cannot be numbered. Well, nowadays we realize that there's probably a hundred billion galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars in each galaxy. And we haven't been able to number them, and we can't even see to the end of the universe. So, indeed, it does seem innumerable. We can't even number them, which is what it says. It cannot be numbered. Well, it wasn't until the 17th century that we discovered this, because beforehand, all that we could see was just with the human eye. So for a long time, people thought that there was only 5,000 stars out there. Well, it wasn't until Galileo came along and the invention of the telescope, and then later the Hubble telescope, that we discovered that there's really so many stars that they can't be numbered. So once again, discovered 17th century, written thousands of years before. What do you think? Related to that, in Genesis 22:17, God talks about the number of stars in the universe being compared to the number of sands in the seashore. Well, gross estimates have shown that the number of sand grains are comparable to the estimated number of stars in the universe. Once again, we didn't know that there was that many stars in the universe until the 17th century. How do you explain that? In Psalm 19.6, it's talking about the sun, and it says, His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So, and this is talking about the sun's circuit. In other words, that the sun actually has a circuit. Well, it wasn't until the 1900s that that was discovered to be true. Estimates have said that the sun is moving between 486,000 miles per hour to 600,000 miles per hour, but it's actually moving in a circuit, a huge circuit, around the whole galaxy. Just like the Earth is moving around the sun in a circuit. So, once again, written 3,000 years ago, discovered 1900s. How do you explain? In Job 38:19, light is said to have a way. And in Hebrew, the, the word way here translates to the word derek, which literally means a traveled path or road. It wasn't until the 17th century that it was discovered that light, in fact, does have a traveled path. Before then, people just thought that light was transmitted instantaneously, like it instantly appeared. However, now we know, and it's common fact, and commonly known, that light does have a path that it travels. In fact, it travels at about 186,000 miles per second in a straight line. Indeed, there is a way of light, just like the Bible says. Job 28.25 talks about the weight for the winds. As you can imagine, it was once thought that air was weightless. Yet 4,000 years ago, this was written in the Bible that there was a weight for the winds. And in recent years, meteorologists have calculated that the average thunderstorm holds thousands of tons of rain. To carry this load, air must have mass, it must have weight. 
Indeed, there is a weight of the wind. Ecclesiastes 1.6 reads, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Well, this was written 3,000 years ago in the Bible. However, it wasn't until World War II that airmen discovered the jet stream circuit, that there's actually naturally occurring paths and circuits of air in our atmosphere, in the air on the Earth. Before this discovery during World War II, it was thought that wind just blew straight. In Proverbs 17.22 it reads, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And you've probably heard about those recent studies that show that depression actually makes you live less and that laughter and positive outlook on life, optimism, makes you live longer. Well, these are actually recent studies in the 1900s and early 2000s that this was discovered that this verse is actually true. I like this next one because it takes what evolutionists who try to push this theory of cavemen were the first primitive ancestors and tells exactly what they were. Job 31 through 8 talks about cavemen, that certain vile men who were derived from society to forage among the bushes for survival and who lived in the clefts of the valleys and in caves of the earth and the rocks. In other words, cavemen were simply outcasts and homeless people and not our primitive ancestors as evolutionists want you to believe. So those are the ones that I wanted to summarize from that 101 video. There's many more in that video. As you can imagine, there's there's 101 total that he lists. I would like to list a few more here that weren't in that. Job 9, 8, Isaiah 42, 5, Jeremiah 51, 15, and Zechariah 12, 1 tells us that God and God alone stretches out the heavens keeps on talking about stretches out the heavens, stretching out the heavens. Well, heavens, he's talking about the universe. That's what he calls it in the Bible. And so this was actually discovered in 1929 by Edwin Hubble. And it was actually Einstein who proposed that the universe was static. In other words, not expanding, not contracting, just standing still before that. In fact, it was Einstein's biggest blunder, in other words, his biggest mistake that he'd ever made. And he later admitted that he made that mistake after the discovery of Edwin Hubble in 1929. So it's in the Bible numerous times, and yet we have probably one of the smartest people in the world that most people, Americans, can think of, Einstein, is wrong. And I think it's just, this is just God saying that, look, the smartest person you can think of, I'm smarter than that. I'm God. And so, you know, he is all-knowing. Job 38.31 reads, Can you bind the clusters of the Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? And in the King James it reads, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Here the Bible is talking about Orion and Pleiades, which are star clusters. Well, amazingly enough, the Bible is right about both these clusters. We weren't able to examine them until the telescope invention, but the star cluster of Orion has now been confirmed to be loose. In other words, it does not have enough gravitational pull to hold itself together. It's literally falling apart. And at the same time, Pleiades is held together by gravitational force. It's not one that is falling apart. In Genesis 3.15, God mentions that the woman has seeds. And although it's a widely known fact today that women have seeds or eggs, scientists didn't discover this till 200 or 300 years ago. See, back then, it was actually believed that the man's seed was all that was necessary in order to create life. So, once again, this discovery was a relatively recent discovery, yet it was written thousands of years ago in the Bible. And the last one here, Job 38, 28. God talks about the father of rain and dew, which is humidity. 
hath the reign of father, or who hath begotten the drops of dew. And humanity was not discovered until 1650. So those are just some proofs of the Bible to consider. Like I said, there's a clip that has 101 of them. I just include a few of them and add some more that it didn't have. There is plenty of evidence that shows that the Bible has supernatural origin and has prophesied beforehand what scientists later discovered. The fact of the matter is, God wrote this book, people. He is the creator of all that we have in front of us today. And now, what do we have next? We have Revelation. We have Armageddon, the upcoming Armageddon. It's going to happen very, very soon probably within Obama's presidency. They are so close to starting this thing and we have a choice. There's a spiritual warfare going on people and time is running out. It is almost gone.